Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to the Nautel webinar on Single Frequency Networks for HD Radio, Synchronizing the iBox Signal and the Design, Implementation, and Field Trials. I'm Chuck Kelly, and I'm joined by the r insanely intelligent and popular uh, Philip Schmidt, who is uh, one of the most popular uh, interviewees I think I've ever had on webinars. Welcome, Phil. Yes, hello. It's great to have you along with us today. I, I should mention, this is going to be a very technical presentation, so make sure your coffee is topped off. Make sure you're strapped in. This is going to be fun. We're going to talk about single frequency networks as they exist today, mostly analog. We're going to talk about how SFMs are used. We're going to talk about establishing SFM planning parameters and matching desired, undesired signal ratios to signal delay. We're going to talk about how Nautel uh, implements HD SFMs. And we're going to talk about a real-world example out at KUSC in Los Angeles. Um, next slide, please. There are, is an opportunity in this presentation for you to ask questions, and you'll note that on the uh, GoToWebinar app on the right-hand side, there's a place you can plug in your questions. Uh, please type them in. We will attempt to get at some of them at least uh, by the end of the webinar, but we've got a lot of content, so it may very well be that we won't get to them all, and we will answer you by email. And with that, Mr. Schmidt, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Chuck. Well, first, let's have a look at uh, how FM single frequency networks are used today. And certainly, they are in common place in a number of places. Um, the FCC essentially treats them as fill-in transfer stations that just happen to be on the same frequency. The intent being, if you have a station like we have over here, um, a 25 kilowatt here with uh, some terrain obstruction, and you have to service another community behind the terrain obstruction and put a booster. Um, as long as that booster's protected contour is within the primary's protected contour and the uh, ERP is less than 20% of the main stations, you're, you're good to go. Um, so that is, and certainly you can have more than just one booster as well. That's pretty commonplace today. However, it's very important that we plan the system in such a way that we minimize the uh, potential on-channel interference to the primary station signal um, with the community of license. So that's part of the topic today is how do we do that and uh, also how to add APT into the mix. Now it's important to note that uh, while the FCC certainly has uh, very uh, certain guidelines, there's similar guidelines in different jurisdictions, um, while this is very US centric, and there's international rules and regulations. So check with your local regulator to, for more information as to how to, uh, for the specifics in your area. One of the applications that um, uh, certainly is uh, of interest is uh, you know, single frequency network coverage of uh, let's say an extended roadway. Um, and in this case, rather than having one large transmitter, you could have many smaller transmitters that could then cover the entire length. You could also have smaller boosters, micro booster stations that can then have some localized content on only some of the carriers, for example. Um, so HD would be very good for that. You can have underground tunnel micro boosters where you don't have coverage from your main. You can have uh, you know specific ones for that for uh, safety information and whatnot. And each you know each individual node we can have some local content potentially that breaks away from the overall identical content across the network to have some sort of local uh, traffic advertising and whatnot. Um, so this is a very interesting application area that I think will uh, draw more attention in the future. But uh, maybe more immediately, you know, it's, it's no secret the FM band is full. Um, it's very tough to uh, find space for new stations um, and uh, to find the white space to do so. And uh, so in our case here, for example, let's say we have um, two co-channels that are already in and in, installed and they're properly allocated. They're not interfering with one another. Uh, but let's say you've got another market in between that you want to cover, but you can't because your own interfering contour um, as shown in this in this dotted line here, well, it will stuck on your neighbor's toes. So certainly that's, you know, we can't do that. Um, so one of the options might be let's replace the single higher power station with several smaller ones and therefore uh, decrease the interference um, to your co-channels and therefore still serve the uh, particular uh, community you know, of question. Um, so that's certainly an of interest in, in a lot of areas. And, you know, there's only so much you can do with directional antennas. Uh, using you know multiple 
boost installations allows you to shape your coverage area to your specific needs. On a wider area, uh, let's say you have a mandate to cover a state or a nation or a larger geographic area. Today, a lot of times we do that using translator systems, but using multiple frequencies. So in this case, I've shown, let's say, a, a situation where you use three frequencies to uh, cover a larger area. A lot of times, you know, it's more than just three, depending on, on your area and your situation. Um, but it's certainly a very inefficient use of spectrum. If it's truly the same content, it would be a lot more efficient if we could coalesce all of these into a single frequency and therefore freeing up the other unused uh, frequencies for, for other purposes, for other stations. So that's certainly more spectrum efficient. You know, looking down a road, um, you know, all digital HD, all digital IBOC uh, will certainly make good use of single frequency networks. Today, while we're still in hybrid FM plus HD uh, operation, uh, we're, we're, and we'll see that in a little bit more detail in future in the slides down, down below, um, it, it's really the FM that's a limiting factor. Once we can get beyond that, all digital IBOC is, is ideally suited, and we're showing here as an example our HD multiplex that uh, it combines three HD stations in one transmitter. And each one of these stations could optionally be part of an SFM. They don't all have to be. You could pick and choose which ones you'd want to be. Um, and you could reserve some of the carriers for local content, for example. Overall, this would allow you to offer a lot more diverse content um, on use the existing spectrum and more importantly, the existing receivers that are already in the field. Um, and this application here is more for illustration purposes because I thought it demonstrates some of the challenges that we're facing with synchronizing HD. Um, so let's say we envision a main and a backup transmitter, both being fed from one exporter, same content, uh, but typically a backup transmitter is off. You're running on the main transmitter only. But if you have to switch over, um, what will happen? Uh, today, most IBOC or XGen modulators are not specifically time synchronized, and you could have signal differences in the order of 100 microseconds to 10 milliseconds, um, depending on make model and uh, situation configuration. So when that happens and we switch over from our main transmitter to a backup transmitter, the receiver was locked on to the original symbol stream as shown up in the top graph here. And each one of these represents one IBOX symbol or about 2.9 milliseconds of time. Um, and if we take that symbol stream away and replace it with an offset symbol stream, it can confuse your receiver. Um, and it, will, it can take it some time to uh, determine that it's totally lost uh, the, the symbol stream and then reacquire. Because you have to keep in mind, this is not a situation a receiver would normally experience in the field. Um, you know, any of the multipath or Doppler shift or any of those um, impairments uh, would not be as drastic as this. So receivers are not designed to handle anything like that. So it takes them a little bit of time to sort of reset and resynchronize. So what we really want to do is align the two symbol streams to be uh, the, for, for one thing, the modulation has to be identical, but then also the time has to be identical. And in that case, when we switch over, um, and we have demonstrated that at, at NAB this year, and uh, we can certainly do that here as well, uh, we can have a seamless cutover from the main to the backup transmitter. So looking at uh, how to actually plan for an SFN, here are some of the uh, planning parameters um, that uh, we developed here in the lab and uh, that we've researched. Um, and it's essentially two parameters we have to look at. Um, you know, we're dealing with two or more signals, so the desired versus undesired ratio is, is of importance, um, and as well as the uh, timing alignment. The nice thing is that uh, as far as FMSFNs goes, there's certainly research out there. Uh, for example, here, the ITU has uh, studied uh, this a little bit, and they've looked at the um, audio impairment, the subjective audio impairment uh, based on their grading scale, which goes from excellent quality to uh, some impairment but not annoying to slightly annoying and then once you get to two and one it gets you know, progressively worse. Um, one of the, the, the key points in this slide to take away is that uh, the requirements are a lot more lenient for mono uh, FM transmission because it's a more robust signal. Uh, for stereo FM, we really need to look at either having one signal 14 to 16 dB stronger than the other, and we definitely want to be within 10 microseconds of time alignment in the interference zone, and we'll get into that a little bit more 
But just for a point of reference, the 10 microseconds um, represents about three kilometers of signal flight time. And it's important to note too that even if you have the signals perfectly aligned, you know, the, 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 the careful listener, the uh, audiophile can certainly still pick out impairments, but generally they're not annoying, um, <laughs> whatever that means to a particular listener. So we've set up a similar test to that in uh, our lab here. Uh, I've taken two Nautile transmitters, um, and uh, uh, you see the block diagram on top here. Um, got, they're all being fed from one modulator, and I had two transmitters um, that I could control, A, the delay, and the relative signal strength with an attenuator here. Uh, they were all coupled together, so I'd have the two signal sources, and they were all being fed and split into just a typical FM receiver and an, an FMD mod to look at the MPX spectrum. So the MPX spectrum over here um, is the output of that piece of equipment. And I wanted to look at uh, how closely do the signals really have to be. I wanted to kind of repeat the tests that we've seen before and um, uh, with the two signal sources. So if you have just a single signal, you know, as shown in the green, the lower the dark green curve uh, down here, certainly you've got a very low MPX noise floor. Um, but even if you have the two signals perfectly aligned and perfectly um, level aligned as well, um, with a zero offset, you still have a little bit of extra noise regrowth. But, I mean, that's still acceptable. But as you add more and more time offset, the regrowth in the MPX um, increases until, of course, at some point, it is going to be noticeable to your listeners. And, um, you know, at some point, people will turn off. So the graph on the right-hand side here is, is similar to that, but what I've done here is I've dialed in a particular delay, let's say four microseconds between the two signals, and I started to attenuate one of the signals, the undesired, until the desired is, you know, in this case, about 7, 8 dB higher than the other. And at that point, I could hear the impairment, but it was still okay. I mean, it wasn't horrible. I would not change the channel for that. Um, but, I mean, if you listen for it, you hear the impairment. And then if you keep on uh, increasing the signal at some point, you can push the noise flow floor in the MPX back to the original levels. So the way to read this graph here, that's sort of a bit of a planning guideline, I should say. Um, so what you need to do is look at your particular situation, your main and booster signal coverage, perform some RF simulations, um, figure out where the signal is, let's say, below 15 dB, 40 FM here, and make sure that there that you can cover all of these spots within 10 microseconds. And we'll get into a little bit of how to um, determine how to um, uh, figure out what the uh, differential delay offsets are. Now, we've done similar tests for HD. Uh, the difference between HD and analog is, in the analog world, of course, any interference, uh, it, it manifests itself as uh, noise and impairment. Uh, so it's fairly subjective. Um, the nice thing with HD is we have some real metrics that are uh, similar. Uh, you don't have audio impairment as such. Um, the audio impairment uh, does not manifest itself until you really hit the digital cliff where you really have no more reception. Uh, so that's different from the analog case, but the analogous um, concept is the bit error rate. Um, so you can, we've got a plot here where you see the bit error rate on your y-axis. So the higher you go, the more errors you have. And once you cross about this red line here, um, you'll start to have eye block reception issues. And at some point, you lose HD lock entirely. So you know, while you're down in a 10 to the minus 3, so 1 in a 1,000 bits in error, well, the Ford error correction can handle that easily enough. Um, your receiver will not skip a beat. Uh, you still have good audio at 10 to the minus 2 and beyond. But at some point, you'll start to have intermittent audio dropouts, uh, but the signal overall still stays locked, but you might have one or two second drops here or there, and at some point the HD lock is dropped entirely, and at that point you just have no HD left. So some of the conclusions here is even if we have our signal totally timelined, as shown in this curve here, the blue, um, so the two signal sources are timelined, and even if they're at identical signal levels, you will have bit errors. But those bit errors are at a low enough level that it does not affect the overall broadcast. It's still below the IBOC reception limit. Um, so that's the big difference between analog and digital is that we can hide the interference um, and uh, in the end, uh, the end product, the end audio is not impacted. So as we're shifting in delay, so we've got 10 microseconds here, 20, 
40, and all of those stay below the eyeball perception limit. So if, as long as your two signal sources are within that, you are okay. Um, but at some point, at 75 microseconds, I found that's pushing the envelope. At that point, we're starting to cross the eyeball rece reception limit, somewhere in a 2 to 3 dB range, and uh, you could uh, consider getting some drops. The other thing to look at here, if there's com two completely separate eye box signals, if they're two milliseconds out, or even two completely different stations for that matter, uh, you know, if you have four to five dB signal difference, you will have good reception as well. So in the end, we don't have to consider any um, any of the uh, the higher differentials. And once once the signal is within five to seven dB, let's say, and I've been using seven to be a little bit conservative here, um, once one signal is stronger than seven dB than the other then uh, it will simply take over. So let's figure out some of the delays and uh, just some of the uh, important points here is that um, you know, we need to consider the flight time of the signal from main to booster and any of the geography that, that you're concerned about um, at the speed of light. So um, you know, we're talking microsecond differences here so it, it actually does make a difference. So for example, in this case, we've got a main and booster about 26 kilometers apart um, if you hold off one of them, we can actually figure out where in the geography the two meet at point X, Y, X, y and Z. If you hold off the, trans the transmission of the booster, then you will get a different set of curves like that. We'll see them in a little bit, depending on how far you hold off the transmission on the booster. Uh, and we can solve for all of this with use using mathematical equations, but it's probably best just to see in an animation next. So, for example, let's, uh, if you have a main and a booster and they're perfectly synchronized and they emit the same signal at the same time, obviously the two wave fronts will meet right in the center, and the equal delay line is right in the center, it's just a straight line. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to calibrate out the time that it takes for the main signal to reach the booster. Uh, so let's say in our case it was 26 kilometers, at, or about 87 microseconds. Um, so in that case, you know, we've, we've sort of calibrated out the overall flight time from point A to point B. But what we want to do is take off, send it back the other direction so that the two will meet somewhere in between. Um, we found earlier that 40 microseconds gives us a good, um, so very good uh, reception and coverage. So we offset it by 40 microseconds and now the two wave fronts meet in the middle. And the relative time difference between the two is good in any of the areas shown in green and uh, uh, we, we don't even have to worry about what the relative signal ratios are in those because the time difference will simply take care of that. So that's pretty straightforward. The more challenging part is to how do we actually match that with our interference regions. Um, and uh, to sort of simplify our situation here is I've, I've, I've created up a, a very simple and simplistic simulation to some extent. Uh, that just assumes a flat world, um, uh, there's no terrain obstruction here, um, but you know, more or less just to demonstrate the point. And all I've done is I've used the FCC F5050 curves for our transmitter that we looked at earlier and sort of figured out what the uh, field strength would be based on that. Um, now we're evaluating the various uh, parameters that we had for FM stereo. We, we said earlier that we need 14 dB or better than, and better than 10 microseconds. So we can look and see where that would happen with a booster. For mono, we look for a 3 dB difference and again, 10 microseconds. Uh, but for iBlock, we have 7 dB, but we have 40 microseconds of timing margin. Um, so let's, let's have a look and see what that will look like. So for stereo, we mentioned earlier, that's the, the most challenging case here. Um, we've put uh, a little 250 watt booster to the upper right hand corner there. Um, and you can see that the, um, Anything bounded by those yellow lines, that's the area that we're within 10 microseconds. So even within our situation here, it's a relatively small part of the map. Um, and beyond that, it's very easy to get into uh, signal differences of less than 14 dB, um, especially as the two signals um, you know, uh, propagate outward. Um, so anyways in here could potentially be interference areas. So the moral of the story really is for Stereo FM, you really want to look at uh, how you can use terrain shielding um, to sort of mitigate uh, some of the interference issues 
look at various antenna patterns and uh, really pull out every trick in the book to make that happen. It is certainly possible, but it, it is certainly challenging. To simplify that graph, Phil, that the red area is what we would call the mush zone. <laughs> sure, exactly. Let's call it the mush zone. <laughs> Very good. Um, the same situation for mono FM certainly improved greatly because the mush zone, as we uh, now term it, um, is, uh, is only within 3 dB, uh, so that makes it uh, much easier. And, uh, but our timing margin hasn't really improved, um, so really we can only improve the interference zones in, in, in only a few places on the map. Now the big difference is for IBOC. Um, now our parameters earlier that we established of 40 microseconds is really what's giving us uh, a big break here. Now for a situation like that, we can see that um, you know, the area bounded by the yellow region here is now encompassing essentially the entire coverage area. And I can eliminate that last little bit here as well by uh, you know, taking out a little bit more delay. I just kept it in there to show you that it's bounded from here to here. And um, uh, so overall, we can achieve seamless coverage across all of that. And why stop at one booster? Um, we can certainly do multiples. And you now we just have to make sure that they don't interfere with the main, nor should they interfere with each other. Uh, but in theory, yeah, yeah, we could do that today. Multiple IBOC boosters would be fantastic. So let's have a little look at uh, how to go about implementing something like that. Uh, the first step, uh, we can't stress that enough, um, really look for a, a, a good broadcast engineer with expertise in uh, SFN installations, um, a consultant on, on that area, because the very first thing that you really need to do is you know, plug in Irish cover simulations for your situation. Um, then evaluate various booster locations and antenna patterns uh, so that the interference zones uh, will be minimized. And what's different about looking for good booster locations, typically for main transmitters, you look at, you know, your highest point, your highest mountain locations, you know, um, towers, uh, skyscrapers, uh, big, big, large buildings to place your main antenna. What's different with a booster is you probably want to hide it behind uh, some terrain so that you only cover the particular areas of interest. Um, so that's a little bit different here. So you, you really want to take a hard look as to where to place these because they're typically not in your normal uh, broadcast site locations. Um, and really, somebody really need, uh, with experience in those areas should, should be able to uh, pinpoint those. Uh, next, you know, we have to certainly look at the optimal time offsets, which might be different for the FM and the IBOC, and certainly there's, there's various legal matters that a uh, consultant can certainly help with here. Um, now, Tel provides all, we can provide the components, we can provide you with the tools, but overall the system design is still the responsibility of the professional consultant. What I, what I would add here, just to simplify what you're saying, Phil, because I completely agree with what you're saying, um, but what I would add is, there's always going to be some mush zones. There's always going to be some interference zones, particularly when you're talking about the analog. The point and the and the magic that a good consultant can do, he can use terrain, he can use antennas, he can use differential power, he can use timing to put those interference zones where not very many people are. Right, and, 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 and perform the calculations. Exactly, perform the calculations. How many people do you gain versus how many do you lose? And, and what are the demographics of those populations? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, next is, well, let's have a look at the FM audio because we've already established that's the more challenging case. And while we're still broadcasting hybrid FM and HD, well, we certainly have to look at how to synchronize the FM audio. So the first case would be, um, let's assume we have a, just a basic left-right audio STL, but for, for, for now, let's assume it's a fixed latency STL. Um, which, you know, with fixed latency, we're talking about within one or two microseconds repeatedly. So I don't care how long it takes for audio to come or the audio processor and gets delivered to the exciter. Could be 100 milliseconds, could be 10 seconds, but it has to be the same across all systems all the time. Um, then next, we need to make sure that our exciters, uh, I've shown two here, exciter one and two, it doesn't really matter which one is the main, which one is the booster they have to have fixed throughput latency. That is not a given. Um, certainly not in, in, in all products that are out in the market. Um, 
And uh, certainly one thing I can speak to is I have measured uh, our VS um, uh, product, for example, and found it to be very, very stable. Uh, certainly better than 1.5 microseconds, and part of that is certainly is also measurement error. Um, it, it, I, you know, I, I have no concerns with the uh, uh, audio being uh, um, delivered with a fixed latency through our exciters. Beyond that, we can also add additional fine delay in our exciters uh, at the MPX level and um, you know, uh, uh, fine tune the system to what you need. But it's important to note that you really want to match your, the various nodes in your SCM frequency to the same kind of hardware and potentially even software versions. Um, our exciters, yes, they are fixed in latency, um, but even different configuration options will have different, different latencies. For example, if you feed your uh, exciter with left-right audio, you, whether it be AES or analog, it will take about in the order of four milliseconds to reverse. If you feed it with uh, composite, you know, you're below one millisecond, so it's much faster. There's different DSP involved, different filtering, so different configuration settings can give you a different latency. Um, but the important thing is it always has to be the same latency so we can calibrate it out. Um, the other thing to consider here is if we are transferring left-right audio across the STL, in order to recreate the exact same NPX, we need to recreate the pilot, uh, the 19 kilohertz pilot and both exciters. And in order to have, for those two frequencies to have the same phase, we can apply a one PPS signal to our exciters and uh, with that we can dial in the phase of the, um, of the pilot and recreate the same MPX. You also want to have uh, 10 megahertz hooked up. Um, you know, if you have a GPS module at the site already, it usually produces both signals anyway. But the 10 megahertz allows you to um, you know, stabilize your, um, your carrier frequency, make sure that both are uh, uh, exactly the same frequency. Um, but it also stabilizes the delays uh, inside the exciter as well. Uh, a few other things to think about with the FM deviation first you need to make sure that you've calibrated out your um, FM deviation very, very carefully, um, you know, to within under 0.1 dB total deviation. And that includes all the components in the MPX, your left plus right, uh, your RDS, your SCAs, everything has to be, you know, very, you know, the total moderation needs to be very, very much the same. But an, then, another... Go I was going to say that I was going to say that the the accuracy required in terms of total modulation index, as you've just described, is pretty much um, in excess of what is available through any kind of analog STL. So this is what absolutely mandates having a digital lossless STL for these paths, because nobody with a green little green screwdriver or a greenie, as it's called, could possibly adjust something within a tenth of a dB. Yes, exactly, exactly. Another interesting thing that uh, we found out is that um, not all uh, FM transmitters would necessarily produce positive frequency deviation for a positive MPX signal. Um, so it, it could actually be that um, your, uh, your frequency deviation would be going negative for a positive MPX. Um, so essentially it's an audio phase reversal in, in your receiver, which typically is not a big deal at all. Um, but we found that across the industry, not all transmitters are made exactly the same. And for that reason, we have a configuration setting in, uh, I think, pretty much all of our equipment now that allows you to set the uh, frequency deviation either to be positive or negative. Um, so certainly, if you, have, if you have any issues with that, give us a call, and we can, uh, we can help you out with that. But an important thing with this topology is, as far as I know, there is no way to synchronize multiple RDS generators in a situation like that, or SCAs. Um, uh, you know, I, I just don't think there's a solution like that. So at this point, if you're going with left-right audio SDLs, if you really want to get a good, good uh, um, SFN signal on the air, I think there is no way to get RDS or SCA properly on there. Now, I can't tell you how much the degradation that would introduce, but um, certainly from a technical point of view, they, at this point, they cannot be synchronized. So what makes the installation a lot easier, in some ways, if you move your stereo generation back to the studio, um, and we're you know, co-located with the audio processor, uh, potentially even be in similar equipment with that, uh, but if you create, if the stereo generation is back to studio, and you see an example of um, 
an MPX spectrum from our uh, transmitters uh, with the left bus right, left mice right, RDS and SCAs and a 19 kilohertz pilot in, the, in there. If you move that back there, then it's still in on the common part before it branches out to all the different nodes. So we don't have to synchronize anything. We just copy the same signal everywhere. So there is MPX encoder and decoder boxes out there that do that for you. Um, and they can account for variable STL delays and ensure that overall you still have a fixed latency delivery of your MPX from the common node to multiple exciters. So in that case, we no longer have to recreate the 19 kilohertz pilot, uh, but the 10 megahertz is still a very good thing to have. Um, so uh, we, still, we still need that. And, so, and look, add one more thing, Phil. The variable STL delay in the middle of the page, people may not understand what, what causes the variability. Um, for instance, if you're using uh, IP to transmit the, the audio, uh, IP by its very nature can be routed by various different routes, and that causes uh, a mm -hmm. different propagation time. The other thing that's possible as well is there are a number of people that, that transmit their audio over satellite. And, and satellite, of course, innately has built-in variable delay. So having some methodology of, of correcting for that dynamic propagation time uh, is very important. Well, exactly. Even if, if you're releasing a line from a telco or whatnot, um, they may switch those lines behind your back, and now suddenly it may take an extra millisecond to get through. Normally, that wouldn't be an issue, but in our situation, it is. Very good. All right. Uh, so some of the options on the market is, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, the vendors is uh, SigmaCom that creates a product called EtherMPX uh, that can work with this. Uh, there's also the FMC01 by 2Wcom. We would just highly recommend that you contact either, either one of these manufacturers for more details to see which one of these units best fit, uh, fit your situation. Um, you know, certainly uh, they will take care of you there. Now, the topic of this presentation, what Nautel brings to the table, is how do we synchronize the IBOX signal? And that's, that's sort of the, what we've added to the system. And it's a little bit of a busy graph to look at here, uh, but in concept, it's similar to what we looked at before. We have one common audio processor back here, uh, but now we also have the exporter over here going to two nodes um, in, in two different directions. So what the concept that we've embraced here is that uh, we try to propagate each signal processing step within one pulse per second boundaries. So for example, at the exporter level, uh, we capture the audio and we make sure that uh, the propagation through the exporter until it sends uh, network packets back out the other side is exactly one second. So even if the internal processing doesn't take entirely one second, uh, we buffered it inside the exporter to give it exactly one second to come through. Uh, not only that, when we capture the audio at the input here, we associate a time tag with it that gets propagated all the way through from input all the way out to the RF output. And that allows us to give us the, the fixed delay. We allow for one second uh, traversal across a variable delay STL. And uh, as long as the network packets, the E2X, the exporter to X-Gen packets, make it through in one second, we're fine. Um, and typically, I mean, even STL, even satellite paths can, can beat the one second uh, uh, rule, no problem. Um, so I don't think, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very lenient um, rule that we uh, impose here. If it were to take more than one second, then we can't guarantee that um, everything would be aligned properly anymore. But as long as that's one second, we're fine. Now, looking at the IBOC modulation over here, uh, so the X-Gen will at some point receive those packets, including the time tag that was back here. And it will make sure that the throughput from the X-Gen is exactly two seconds in our case. Um, you know, it, we found that we needed a little bit more processing. One second wasn't quite enough. So I had to bump it out to two seconds, uh, but the concept is the same. Um, so essentially, we're creating fixed throughput delay by making sure each subsection is a fixed throughput delay. And by doing so, we don't need to have absolute time or any other time marker. The one PPS signal from a GPS uh, unit uh, or built into the exporter uh, will take care of that. So what equipment overall do you need? Well, for FM analog, certainly you need your transmitters. Um, but the important thing to highlight 
is if you want to do HD radio with, uh, um, uh, with, with your SFN, uh, you do need not have transfers for both main and the booster. Um, just so that we can apply the synchronization to it. A couple lab results that I just want to share with you briefly here. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a spectrum, uh, not a spectrum, a, an oscilloscope plot of two transmitters, um, uh, the green and the purple, and you can see the signal peaks in the two are pretty much the same, showing you that they're aligned in time. And you can see sort of the, the guard interval between two symbols where power rolls off to zero for a brief moment in time before the next symbol starts. And it's perfectly aligned within that as well. And we find that you know, every combination of rebooting, resetting connections, um, you know, we can always restart the signal within about two microseconds. And then we can, of course, dial in the uh, differential offset that we want. So we've, we've done a couple of field trials with uh, KUSC in LA. And uh, KUSC is, uh, is a 39 kilowatt directional on Mount Harvard. You can see the, uh, the main transmission site down here. Um, LA is mostly down here. Um, and it, it, the main transfer does a great job covering all of LA, uh, but it doesn't do such a great job in Santa Clarita up here. Um, so that's, there's a mountain range in between here that's shielding it for the most part. So they've already had a, a 200 watt directional uh, FM only booster at the time that uh, was uh, directed at Santa Clarita and it does a great job uh, filling in that, that valley. Um, so we've just come along and essentially uh, upgraded to HD. On the, the, the main transmission site, uh, KEOC had a Nautel NV15 with our uh, integrated X-Gen um, and all the uh, synchronization signals that uh, we, applaud, uh, we talked about earlier. Um, in their particular setup, they had chosen to co-site uh, or, or put the Exploder Plus right at the site. Um, so it was pretty straightforward to synchronize the uh, NV15 with the Nautel Exploder Plus because they were sitting side by side. And by doing so, we could use a GPS built into the Exporter Plus to drive uh, any of the synchronization signals of the NV15. What was a little bit more challenging in this setup is that we required um, two T1 paths, first back to studio, uh, to transmit the uh, Exporter to XGen IP traffic, first to the studio, then from the studio back out to the old mountain transmitter site. Uh, so those were two T1 hops. And our uh, Nautel reliable HG transport protocol really helped with uh, packet retransmissions and making sure that uh, we have a reliable connection between that exporter to the remote um, uh, Oak Mountain site that had ABS 300. And in that ABS 300, we dialed in a differential delay that uh, made sure that all of our HD synchronization was um, um, set up correctly. Um, we've done some RF coverage studies, and that's, that's the sort of part that uh, you really need to do for your own uh, setup as well. Uh, first, we looked at unsynchronized HD radio, and we looked at any of the areas where uh, the signal is within about 7 dB. Um, so if you've had them completely running unsynchronized, any of the purple dots on here, that's where you would have potential uh, receiver confusion or HD drops. When we synchronize it, uh, we were able to scrub a lot of the interference concerns um, around here because as we looked at earlier at those uh, constant delay zones, if we superimpose those on the situation, you can see everywhere where there's green, we're within those 40 microseconds and um, um, you know, it doesn't really matter what the DU ratio is between the two signals uh, or good. So in that, this case, to achieve that, we had to hold off the booster by 176 microseconds first that's uh, calibrating out the flight time from main two booster, and then we took out 40 microseconds to sort of offset the, the wave fronts a little bit. So when we did the drive tests, um, you know, uh, uh, we tested both minus 20 and minus 14 dB on a booster, and certainly not surprising enough, we had solid coverage in Santa Clarita, uh, no issue there. But more interesting is when, uh, when they tried some of the uh, more challenging terrain with uh, canyons, um, they, they noted even when there was severe FM impairment, either due to no signal from either transmitter or, or, or um, you know, an interference zone between the two, even when there was severe FM impairment, um, the HD was blocked. Um, and if, if it dropped, it was only very intermittently when there was really no uh, signal from either. 
The, the area that we focus on a little bit more, just because we predicted more interference in that area, uh, was that Silmar region over there. Um, and in that case, uh, you know, we did notice a few uh, drops here and there between underpasses because there's very little uh, signal from either transmitter in that area. Um, but every time it came back right away within a second or two, so it was just a, a short intermittent drop. Um, and that really proves to me that the IBOC is properly synchronized. Overall, we were very impressed with, you know, it's really only two watts of IBOC um, that was put on air, and it really improved the coverage, uh, particularly in Santa Clarita. So overall, this was a success, and we want to uh, thank both uh, and the folks at KUSC for helping us out with those tests, and the system's still on air today. It's running. Um, as far as I know, it's running well. And we also want to thank John Keane for doing some of the RF uh, uh, simulations and coverage studies um, on, on these plots. So in conclusion, um, you know, the, the take home today is that FM stereo SFNs, while they're certainly possible to do, uh, they're, they're challenging um, to get them done right. Uh, mono, yeah, that's certainly uh, easier. Um, but IBOC really, yeah, it's, it's, it's not only is it possible, um, I think that's really, uh, it's going to shape the way how we're going to move forward with seamless coverage between between transmitters. Um, we're the first, Nautilus is the first uh, you know, uh, to offer a solution for that. There have been various uh, trials and experiments in the past, but we're offering solutions now. Um, and um, we do have fixed audio throughput delay. And uh, we have demonstrated uh, at NAB and uh, other places that we can seamlessly hand off well, one transmission on a receiver to the next, and the receiver never skips a beat, um, which really demonstrates the concept. And of course, the field trials at KUSC were uh, a big success, and we're looking forward to uh, take this further now. So, if you're interested in, uh, you know, a limited release, you know, give us a give us a, draw, a note and fill out um, some of the uh, surveys that we're going to have at the end of this, and uh, we can take it from there. Well, back to you, Chuck. Thanks very much, Philip. That's fascinating. And, and I'm sure that there's a lot of questions, but people may be scratching their heads and asking um, how to phrase their various questions. So uh, don't worry about that. Just just type in whatever you want to type in, and, and we will get back to you. Um, uh, go ahead, next slide there, Phil. Of course, the, the a really important thing, besides all of the, the technology leading information, uh, next slide, uh, is also the fact that our products are supported by the best uh, best team in the industry. Uh, Nautel customer support makes all the difference. You can have great technology and great products, but everything fails eventually. And uh, these guys make sure that, these folks make sure that uh, uh, your, uh, your station stays uh, on the air and uh, is working. Next. And as I said, we will answer questions uh, if we can now. If you can't, uh, go ahead and, and we will answer you by email. And next slide. You can always get lots more information about Nautel from our Nautel Waves newsletter, uh, from our webinars, and, and also from our YouTube channel. And I will tell you that this webinar is likely to be on the web within the next few minutes. Well, actually, up to 24 hours. We'll give, we'll give Matt the time to get it done right. But you may be able to find it on both of our webinars page on the website and on YouTube if you miss something or you want to recommend it to friends and or other folks that you want to uh, have this information. So let's look at a couple of the questions that uh, have come in so far and see if we can't uh, get some quick answers. Uh, um, these boosters will also carry the HD1, 2, and 3 streams too. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, although it's possible to separate out those streams. Is that correct, Phil? Well, in general, I guess it will be the same broadcast between main and booster. So everything yep. that's bundled, in your main, bundled into the main uh, will be carried through as well. As I mentioned one of the slides before, it is possible to potentially break out some of the other logical channels in HD, um, yep. but that's certainly still a research area, um, but it's, it certainly would be possible to have some localization if you wanted to. And there's a question about how to uh, participate in the limited SFN study, and, and uh, you can answer it on the questionnaire and or send the email to Matt Hurden, as was as shown on an earlier slide. Uh, relative to the localized P3 channels, how is this implemented to different locales from a single exporter-importer installation, uh, uh, Phil? Well, as I said, that's still a research area that we need to look into. So the uh, 
and the particular equipment questions, uh, um, it would probably have to be a separate exporter entirely. Um, but we'll have to look at that when it gets there. Okay, very good. Um, is there any holdover capability under GPS denial? Right, okay, so if your GPS drops, I guess that's the question, and yep. it won't hold over. And certainly the exporter plus itself, we have a uh, temperature compensated uh, ovenized uh, crystal oscillator with, with very good holdover specifications. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the system would still work, um, and both, uh, so the exporter wouldn't be a, a big issue. It can hold over for quite some time. Uh, in the end, what will happen is the two will slightly the, you know, the they'll drift apart. They'll start to drift. Yeah. And as long as the system comes back while they're not too far, it will slew itself back in. So uh, the problem is the amount of time you've got in terms of holdover depends on the difference between the TCXOs in the two pieces of uh, the two boxes. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Uh, let me blow through a couple of other questions real quick. Um, would the Ibiquity Air Fiber be okay? Oh, I suspect that's Ubiquity. Air Fiber be okay to use between sites for this? Well, um, as long as you can carry the data capacity, which in our case is about uh, 300 kilobits per second to carry the E2X stream, yep. um, as long as it makes it there within one second, I'm sure the Air Fiber would do that no problem. For sure. Um, I don't think that would be an issue. And reliable okay. HU transport can take care of any drop packets. And the last question we're going to be able to have a chance to answer today are, if we're sending the MPX over AES from the studio, do we need a GPS clock at the studio? If we're sending the MPX over AES from the studio, do, yeah, it's the same question. So uh, if, and the answer I think is yes, because we're going to stamp those with those, with those two third-party products. Right, and I think those products generally do require some, some way of synchronizing, uh, but some of them also use a precision time protocol rather than using GPS. Okay, very good. And that's all we've got time for today. Um, I, again, if there are questions, send them to Matt Herden or, or myself. My email address is here. And uh, thank you for participating in this webinar on, on uh, SFNs with a particular interest on SFNs as it relates to HD radio. In the meantime, uh, for Phil Schmidt, thank you, Phil. I'm Chuck Kelly, thanking you all, and take care. Bye-bye now. Bye.